Well, hey, Grace, this is Ryan Peterson, obviously coming to you off site. And uh, the reason why we wanted to do it this week is because I want to share a story with you that actually happens outside of church. So we figured we'd get outside of church to tell the story. And I want you to, uh, as we read through this, I really want you to use your imagination. We're going to be in John chapter 8 today. So if you have your Bibles, go there, John chapter 8. And it's the story about a woman who is caught in adultery. Jesus is teaching some people just outside of church um, near the temple courts. And um, the Pharisees bring this woman, and there is a discussion happening. I want you to turn there, but as we go through here, I think it'd be really easy for all of us just to say, okay, I know who I would be in the character. I know who I would be in this particular story, which is Jesus, the rescuer, the man, the, the hero that goes in and just makes everything right, which is a dream of all of ours. But I think reality would also set in to make us realize that we're more of the woman caught in adultery Um, just sitting there exposed, humiliated right before the public and uh, before Jesus and everybody else where we have nothing to do with anything else besides the sin that's right in front of us. I don't know if you've ever been caught and just exposed for who you are or, or when you had a wrong that was done, but it is definitely embarrassing, no doubt. So turn there. I want to read this through you, but I want you to use your imagination. Think about, um, come on, think about the smells. Think about uh, what you would see in the temple courts. Think about who you would be walking around. Think about... Think about what you'd be wearing. You'd probably be wearing flip-flops and a robe. I mean, come on, that's ideal attire for a lot of you, right? You'd come to church with a robe and flip-flops if you could. But I want you to think about really getting in the story and using your imagination. Come on, don't just, don't just shut that down in childhood. Use it here as we walk through the story. It's a quick story, but I want you to think about who you'd be. Here we go. Read along with me if you can. They went each to his own house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. So here it is, they split. The disciples go each to their own house and Jesus is going to the Mount of Olives. Verse two, it says, early in the morning, he came again to the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, placing her in the midst. They said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now listen, the law Moses commanded us tells us to stone such a woman. And then they said this, what do you say? They said it to test him that they might have some sort of charge to bring against him. Jesus then bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as he continued to ask them, he stood up again. Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Verse 8 says, And at once more he bent down, wrote on the ground. But when they heard this, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before her. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she says, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, And neither do I condemn you, so go and sin no more. What a beautiful picture. And I want to start at the very end of this particular picture. And I want to start at the end of the story where where Jesus and, and this woman who is caught in adultery is left alone. I want you to just look at, just for a second, verse 9. It says, But when they all heard this, all the crowd, all the Pharisees, all the scribes, they heard this. They went away one by one. They went away one by one, beginning with the oldest one, all the way down. And then, this is, this is probably one of the most important things of the whole story. Jesus was left alone with the woman. In the midst of public, have you ever had a lot of people around you but just felt isolated? I mean, Jesus is left alone with a woman. This is no doubt the desire of all of our relationships, just to be alone with Jesus. And in the midst of probably one of the hardest times of her life, I mean, think about the lifestyle that she was living. She was, man, she was just looking for a relationship is what she was doing. She was looking for acceptance. She was looking for someone to, to love her unconditionally, care for her and serve her. And that's the, that's the picture that she finally got caught in the midst of because she was doing it in the wrong way. She was going about searching for significance in all different avenues except for the right one. And you're caught, humiliated. I mean, absolutely embarrassed in the middle of everyone. Caught, it says she was caught in the act. 
She got brought out by the Pharisees and the scribes. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes had other reasons to do this. They were doing it to test Jesus. But if you can imagine you and me as the woman who is literally just maybe even caught naked, wrapped around with maybe a robe, just thrown in the midst of it, accused and just pointed the finger at and I don't know about you, but sometimes when I have faults and failures that are like right in front of me and I'm, I'm aware of how much I don't measure up, I'm not, I'm not feeling good at all. It's, it's definitely embarrassing. Imagine how she feels at this point in time. I mean, just secretly going from relationship to relationship maybe and then all of a sudden in public around everybody else that she probably knows and the officials, which are like authorities, the Pharisees and the scribes, as well as Jesus comes here and exposes. And, and there it is, everything's stripped away and it's just Jesus and it's just the woman left alone. It's amazing. Because, because what happens first is acceptance. Jesus says, listen, I'm going to get rid of all the ones who criticize you. I'm going to get all the ones that hate you. I'm going to get rid of all the voices that tell you that you're not good enough. I'm going to get rid of all the things around in your life that you are trying to perform just to receive some sort of value and acceptance. And what's going to happen now is totally different. I'm going to meet you right where you are. This is exactly what Jesus does. He doesn't write us the word. He doesn't give us the Holy Spirit. He doesn't give us religion so that we can climb the ladder to reach him. He says, scrape all that. I'm going to come down out of heaven, off of my throne, down here to earth, and I'm going to live, walk, and talk. Take your place on the cross just to let you know the biggest act that he could ever do is let you know how much you're loved, how much you're accepted, how much you're valued. He didn't have to do any of that. And that's where our story begins. It's where our story starts with acceptance, love, value, and, and not necessarily turned on its side where religion actually tells you, work your way up, then you'll be accepted by God. Read a lot of the word, then you can come to church. Hey, listen, get your life in order, then come and, and get around some Jesus following people. That's religion. Like get your, get your life right and then you'll be loved, valued, accepted, and and grace is totally different. Grace comes and meets you. It says there is an exposure of your sin, of your junk, of your failure, of your trash. You know, there, there's so many things in our past that we are just afraid of. Uh, acts of hate that have been um, given to us, uh, committed uh, crimes. Our heart has been moved in areas of pride and selfishness. There's even people that just need a lot of healing because of what has done to them, where they go through life. Maybe it's you. You go through life and you just feel like the victim. You've been abused. You've been, you've been beat. And, and nobody can imagine the pain and the hurt that you're going through. And you've got two options, really. The Bible talks about your sin, the secret hidden things that we do that's just dividing our lives, dividing our relationship with God, dividing our relationships, maybe on our marriage and our friends and family around here. You got two options. You can hide them. And at some point in time, they're going to be exposed, just like this woman caught in adultery. Or Jesus says, you can just come, come to me and confess them. Give them to me. Open up, like take your soul and just expose it. Like this woman was absolutely exposed. He says, I want you to do the same thing with your heart. Just come on, open it up. Strip away all the facades. Strip away all the other images. Strip away all the other things that you try to hide behind so that you can feel good enough about yourself. Strip all those away and come to me naked. Naked is where we started this journey. Naked is where we began. Naked is where Adam and Eve first got to know the purity of a beautiful idea that God calls marriage between a man and a woman. They're naked and the Bible says unashamed. What's that like? What's it like to be naked? Now think about your heart. I mean, there's a lot of things tucked down in there. Think about what you've been through in your past, what you're thinking about right now, the selfishness and the pride that sometimes just erodes your life. What happens when you just give that up to God and your heart just becomes exposed, open, naked before him, and then he does the unthinkable. 
he does something that you could not imagine. He accepts you. Because he, he, doesn't, he doesn't bank his love off of you about what you do. He banks his love off of who you are. You're a prized possession. You're the image of God. You are loved, accepted by his grace. I mean, he thinks about you more than the sea of the, every single grain of sand on the shore. Think about that. God says in the Psalms, you are the apple of his eye. There is nothing that you can do that's ever going to change that. There's nothing that you can do that can define your identity because I've already defined it. The world can't tell you who you are because God has already spoken so loud, so clear about who you are. You are cherished and you are loved. Now, there's this there's this thing inside of this particular story that I can't help but you know look at and see and it's really just the essence of marriage in the middle of it, the essence of marriage. You know, marriage is this um, relationship between a man and a woman where they come together and, and it says the two will become one. It's a beautiful picture of, of the minds where they have, how they start to think uh, alike, how their hearts start to be woven in together. They come together as two and they come as one. It's a crazy cool picture of, of really just what we desire, which is intimacy. Intimacy of, of our emotions, uh, physical intimacy, intimacy of our mind, oneness all across the board. Every single part of us becomes one with our spouse. And at the midst of this story, uh, adultery happens. And adultery actually exposes marriage. It divides it. See, here's, here's what adultery does. The effects of adultery has devastating things on marriage. So what happens is inside the marriage is it actually gives us a space, a relationship to say, I'm actually the one that you chose. Out of the seven billion people here on earth, you chose me. I, mean, I, can't, I can't believe that idea. In, in marriage, you have the idea where you create a space where trust is built, where, where you can actually say, hey, this is who I am and uh, you're fully accepted. You're fully loved. Where you can honestly be naked and unashamed. Where the things, the deep recesses of your heart can be exposed and the uh, blemishes of your entire life can be seen by one another and they're accepted. You are indispensable. You are irreplaceable. You are the focus. You are the attention when it comes to marriage. And adultery says that you're not. Uh, you're not enough. Uh, you're not the focus. Um, you are replaceable. You are dispensable because I will replace you with somebody else. Adultery comes in and divides it. Uh, it comes in and entertains the idea of what could be um, maybe better off over there. And so adultery is this really good picture of sin. This is exactly what sin does. It's not just marriage that God wants to portray between a man and a woman. It's a portrait of what God wants to display between him being the groom and us being his bride. And sin divides that. Sin entertains the idea in our thoughts and our hearts to say, well, maybe I would be satisfied with this over there. Maybe I would be better off by going entertain that. Maybe that pleasure would be better for me. And maybe God doesn't know best. Maybe, maybe he's holding out on me. Maybe, maybe I'm not really the one that he says. Maybe I can be replaced. And that space of intimacy, that space of trust, that space of oneness gets broken. And that's exactly what sin does. Sin tells us, hey, you're, you're not good enough and we fail and we fall and we're embarrassed and we're exposed. But then God comes in by his grace and does something absolutely crazy. And this is a part of the story that takes a massive turn. I mean, think about this, right? You're using your imagination. You're the woman here and you're just being exposed and Jesus does something crazy amazing. It says in, starts in verse 6. This is what it says. When they came down, Jesus bent down. This is significant. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. 
Now, at first glance, you're thinking, okay, what's the significance of that? But verse 6 actually plays into what you and I actually need to realize what happened in the Old Testament. What happened in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 9, this is a cool picture because I, w- I, want, you to, I want you to catch this just for a second. Um, Moses was told by God, to go get the Israelites out of slavery. So we're gonna pause our story in the New Testament, go rewind ever so slightly, and go back in time in the Old Testament because you need to see this correlation. God is absolutely in love with his people Israel. And he says, listen, they're in slavery, they're in bondage, much like we are, until we meet Jesus. Like we're just bound up in our own life. And he says, I love them so much, I've got to go free them. So he uses Moses and he, and he takes Moses and he says, I'm going, to, I'm going to bring my people into freedom and this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to lead them by day through the desert, through the wilderness. I'm going to lead them by day by a cloud. Well, why would he do that? Because it's provision. A cloud, think about it. If you're in the desert, you need some shade. You need some provision. This is how, this is how he guides them during the day. And at night, he leads them by a pillar of fire. Now, why fire? Because it's cold at night, even in the desert. And it acts as protection. God is freeing his people in Israel through the wilderness. And he does this through a process of 40 years. And then he gets to the point where saying, hey, you're free, you're, you're, you live in the place of abundance, but you still need some direction on how to live. And so I'm gonna give you the 10 commandments. And he brings Moses up, this is significant. He brings Moses up the mountain. And this is, this is what happens, he, he writes the 10 commandments on tablets. And then Moses takes them, runs down. If you're familiar with the story, he runs down and he breaks them. So Moses comes back up a second time. And Deuteronomy 9, 10 says, this is, this is Moses' account. The Lord gave me the two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. God wrote these with his finger. And on them, they were all the words that the Lord had spoken with us on the mountain in the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. So here God is bringing Moses up to say, hey, I've already set my people free, but they need to know how to live. I'm going to write this down. And he did it twice. And I want you to catch what Jesus does at this point. In verse 8, in chapter 8, going back to our story in John, this is what it says. And once more, he bent down on the ground, Jesus looking right at the woman. Everybody else leaves, and he bends down, and he starts writing on the ground. He starts writing down as if the signify what happened in the Old Testament. He came down off the mountain and came to his people in the valley. Almost to signify, I came down from heaven to earth. I'm bending down and writing my word on your heart. I'm coming down because you can't come up to me. I'm coming down to your level to meet you where you are. That's what grace does. Grace completely reorders our life. And when Jesus does this idea of meeting us right where we are, it's like this idea of of John chapter 1 where grace and truth are in the fullness of Jesus. Because in a marriage, um, I don't know about you, but sometimes you just need to come forward and tell the truth. Sometimes there's things that God exposes that life just kind of throws at you, that you get exposed and you realize, I need to tell my wife the truth about what's really going on, about my motives, about what I'm thinking, uh, negative, doubt, fear, whatever the case may be. And when you do that and you expose and, and you just tell the truth, what happens is something freeing. That your spouse in that, that space of unity and oneness accepts you and she loves you unconditionally. And it's a portrait of what God is saying, I want you to realize I love you for who you are, not what you can do for me. And so the order of what God does totally changes and transforms. See, grace reorders our life. And we don't search around our entire life for the things that can make us happy or the things that can actually accomplish something so that we feel good about ourselves. It's not our title. It's not what we do at work. But also, although sometimes we get captivated by what we can do with work because when work is going well, then our confidence is going well. But we have the order totally flipped. What if we were to go to work? What if we were to go to relationships and realize we're already accepted? 
we're already loved, we're already deeply appreciated, and we're already valued by the most important person in our entire life, which is God. And therefore, out of that expression of abundance, out of that expression of joy, out of the expression of love in my heart, what would work look like if I went and sacrificed, went the second mile, honored the people that were there, did things with excellence from a place of excellence? Because I know how God sees me is pure, simple, and the focus of his attention. Grace reorders our life. So when you start thinking about this, where does this go in your life? How do you apply this? What starts to come to mind? We're going to move into all of our campuses, a time of response. And I want you to start thinking about really how grace has reordered your life.